Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Melinda Mochizuki and I'm the Training Events Coordinator at the Center on Network Science at the University of Colorado, Denver. We're excited to have you join us for our November webinar on network evaluation using the Partner Tool, which is part of our monthly webinar series, Network Leadership Lessons from the Field, in which we highlight practices and skills from practitioners working within networks. Before we start, I wanted to just um, share a little bit more about the Center on Network Science. We um, provide tools, um, uh, do research, evaluation, and help build capacity for people and communities that are trying to build networks. Um, and we do that in a number of ways, some of which you can see here. But um, I'm going to, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the tools that we uh, develop. Um, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about the partner tool today, so I won't go too much into that. But I did want to highlight the Person Centered Network app, which is a new tool that we've developed that will be recruiting a pilot cohort starting in January. Um, and what this app does is collect data on personal support networks. A lot of the users that are um, utilizing this tool are providers that screen people in communities to identify the strengths and the gaps within their personal support network and try to link them to community resources in real time. So if you are interested in being part of that pilot cohort, uh, we have an email up here that you can reach out to us and let us know. And so just a little bit of background on what network leadership is. Uh, it's a model to help us um, to help people who are part of cross-sector community efforts learn how to build, manage, and evaluate effective networks. You can learn more about um, network leadership on our website, as well as at our sixth annual Network Leadership Training Academy, which is going to be May 16th through 18th in Denver. It's a three-day workshop um, that focuses on interactive activities and peer learning um, with about 100 people to help them build skills around effectively implementing interorganizational networks. And then our next webinar will take a break in December, but will resume in January. I will be on, on the 24th of January featuring the work of the Colorado Network of Health Alliances, which aims to accelerate change in communities and health policies. And so we hope you'll also stay connected to us after the webinar. Here are different ways that you can um, connect with us on our website, our email, and our social media pages. And I wanted to particularly point out our network leadership group on Facebook where people can post their questions and um, share resources with one another and connect with a community uh, who's working within networks. And then just a few webinar logistics before we get started. So at the end of the presentation, we'll open up to question and answers. And you'll see within the Zoom system, there is a little question icon on your screen. Um, so you can go ahead and start placing your questions in there as they come up. We ask that if you have any technical questions, like your sound isn't working or your slides aren't showing up, to please use the chat box function. And I'll be monitoring that and can respond to you more quickly there. Um, we'll be recording this webinar and we'll send an email with the recording, slides, and other useful resources later this week. And so I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Danielle Varda. She is the um, director of the Center on Network Science and an associate professor at the School of Public Affairs at the University of Colorado, Denver. She also has other appointments in the Colorado School of Public Health and in CU Boulder School of Information Sciences. Uh, she is the author of the Partner Tool and has been doing just really great work in developing tools and building the capacity of people who are working within networks. Um, in their communities. And so she's going to talk a little bit more about the partner tool and probably share a little bit more about her background. So if it's okay, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you, Danielle. Thank you, Melinda. So welcome everyone today. Um, it's a little unusual to be on this side of things. I um, am usually uh, introducing a speaker, but about once a year, and it used to be a lot more often, um, I have um, usually the pleasure to introduce other speakers. We try to bring a lot of practitioners in um, to this work to see if we can um, be sure to share more of the work that happens out in practice and translating um, all of the good work on network leadership that people are doing actually out in communities. So um, today though, uh, we're doing our kind of annual webinar on evaluating networks using the partner tool and um, I'm glad to say that this is a webinar that um, gets a lot of interest. And so 
we had um, almost uh, 250 people um, sign up for this. Of course, you never get that many on your webinars, but um, it's something that we think a lot of folks are interested in. And, and on, for in our center over here, sometimes we wonder, um, what is it that is drawing people to this topic? Um, but we know that a lot of people are involved in networks today in what we call the network way of working and evaluating. So um, it's at our center, this is uh, the kinds of things we do. So just before I, I start, I'll just expand on that a little bit. So we do create these technology tools like the partner tool and the app um, to help folks do this work. Our mission is to build capacity in communities to be able to use data to translate to practice. And um, part of that has been a solution that we have found uh, really viable for us is building technology that helps people collect that data. We've always created low cost tools um, that we want to make sure are accessible and um, are always reducing disparities in access to technology um, in communities, but we also do a lot of evaluation and um, of systems and networks. So we work for a lot of national organizations like the Annie Casey Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as folks like the CDC, um, HHS, and um, for example, the Assistant Secretary of Planning and Evaluation are all projects that we've just done over the last year. Um, but we also work at the state level. Um, one of our favorite ways of working with people is really in local communities a lot of the time with public health departments that have just a little bit of funding they want to do something um, as an evaluation and we always try to help them figure out how they can get that work done so i have a team of five people um, and we all um, work on these projects they're amazing and um, together we're, we're trying to kind of um, bridge what you'll see in a, a moment here um, some of that challenge of, of figuring out what to measure and then linking that to um, uh, ways of translating it to real useful ways of strengthening and improving our networks and our relationships, especially at the community and to organizational level. Um, we also build capacity and um, by doing webinars like this and Melinda mentioned our Network Leadership Training Academy. We're really excited about this year, that this year, and uh, it always fills up really early. We try to keep it um, limited to under 100 people and we do hope that folks um, will sign up for that and join us again this year um, if you are interested in thinking about not just evaluating networks, but all kinds of ways of, of building, evaluating, and managing networks in your community. So it's a really fun event. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, though, on evaluating networks using the partner tool, first I'm going to talk about why network science is a useful evaluation framework and why we've chosen to use that framework. Um, show you what the partner tool is, and then some examples of what you get when you use it. Um, and all of this is going to be like at the 10,000 foot level. So we do full demos on just the partner tool. We just finished a two-day workshop on using the partner tool that we had a bunch of folks come from all over the country. That was a huge success, so we'll probably continue to do those. Um, and and um, but there, th so this is going to be a little bit more of a, and if you've ever seen me present, you're going to know that it's going to go fast. So um, <laughs> keep your questions in the Q&A box, and we'll be sure to have some time to get to that at the end. Um, all right, so I, if you've seen me present, you've seen me present this slide over and over again. So I'm actually not going to present it very thoroughly today. You can almost um, find any recording on a presentation that I've done and see me present this slide, but basically we believe that network leadership um, doesn't belong to just people who run networks. It belongs to people who are also members of networks, um, meaning that for leadership as well as members, citizens, um, organizations, everyone can be involved in network leadership. It's kind of the, the point of it. Um, but we also really base that on a network science perspective. And um, a primary, one of the basic principles of network science is that more is not always better. So there are times when you'll find yourself um, really embedded in what we call a lot of weak ties. We call these the strength of weak ties um, on this picture on the left, where um, there's a reason that you might want to have lots and lots of connections to lots and lots of diverse organizations. And that's what really drives us in doing this network work. But as organizations and people who are trying to kind of evaluate this stuff and figure out what we can um, strategize in order to really leverage these relationships, we need to have different ways of making sense of those relationships. And so what you'll see kind of on the two pictures on the right here are 
um, ways that we can, you know, maintain the kinds of connections that we want, but with strategies that allow us to think about really what are the fewest number of connections we can have to others so that we can then build new diverse relationships, but also not ex totally use up our, what I call our relationship budget, um, without really understanding what the benefit of that is. So something that we really believe in in our center and that we focus on um, with the partner tool is that we believe we can manage these relationships, but that we really need data to do it. Um, and that's really the purpose of the tool is we want to help people think about how to do that work, but we don't think that you can do it without understanding um, data and having evidence to drive that. We can leave managing networks to chance. Um, we can try to intuitively understand if they're working, but um, there's a lot in network science that helps us um, question some of those things. I fundamentally, truly do not believe that you have to be an extrovert to run a network. I believe that you can be, you know, the, the um, most extreme interviewer, but if you have data and a strategy, you can still manage a large group of people um, and relationships. So I don't think it's about just getting along well with people and going to a lot of events. I think there's a lot more to it um, and that's the kind of thing that we think network leadership is about. It's why we think network science is a good framework for that. Just one last slide kind of on that. Um, this I call the evolution of a community network. I think a lot of people who are on the call, especially when we look at who signs up for these things, are people who are involved in community-based networks of some sort. So nothing I talk about has to be about organizations. We could introduce people and, and interpersonal networks into this, but at this point, um, I'm going to kind of frame this around communities, but what often happens in a community, if you can look in the center circle here, um, you see a bunch of nodes and lines, and I'm sorry, a bunch of circles and squares. And if you notice in the four pictures that surround it, there um, those nodes, uh, the circles and squares, don't change in any of the four pictures. The only thing that changes are the lines between them. So what often happens when a funder they gives money for a group to form a network or you know, motivated group of people decide they want to come together because working together is greater than working alone. Um, they'll start over here and what you can, um, what you see is creating um, network ties. So what always happens is the group comes together and they say, let's bring everyone to the table who's working on this topic. Let's say it's um, uh, tobacco prevention. And we're all going to come together and talk about who's working on that, and then we're going to list who's not at the table. And that's kind of our group that we always start with and say, let's invite them, let's form this network of cross-sector diverse partners. So what you'll see on connecting the network no isolates on the, on the right side is that one of the first things that everyone does is begin to invite those who aren't already at the table. And then on the bottom lower left corner, you'll see what happens is we start having meetings and we have lots and lots of meetings. And so we invite as many people as we can um, that we can convince to come that we think are, are associated to come to meetings and, and work on this network with us. And this is where most networks live forever. And we end up evaluating here for a long time. And all that we know here is that one of the metrics for a good network working is that more people are coming to more meetings, or at least the same number of people are coming to those same meetings. And so the only metric we really have created for ourselves there is that more is better. But we just learned that in network science, there's a way of thinking about this that less can be more, maybe more isn't better. So on the far right hand corner on the bottom here, you'll see what we try to do with our partner data, what we try to do with people in network leadership training, is get them to a place where we're really thinking about how do I bring a group of people or a group of organizations together, and how do I construct those relationships so that we can have basically the fewest number of interactions um, and ask people to come the fewest number of times that we absolutely need them and give everyone a role while they're there, and then in that way run our network more efficiently. So on this bottom picture here, you'll see just an example of um, a way that you can construct a network. It doesn't have to be how every network is constructed, but let's say you have four work groups here and they meet at different intervals, depending on what they need. Once a year, your network comes together over here um, in a big uh, annual meeting. But what you're doing here is you're asking people to come less often with a role in mind. We believe that in order to get to this bottom right corner, you need to have thought about this um, have some data in order to, to make this kind of structure happen. Things on 
um, information like who does what together, what are their strengths, what are the perceptions that people have of one another, um, who can play these leadership roles, and then find out where the commitment is, and then start to measure how well that's working. So with the partner tool and our framework, we really try to get away from just counting and measuring more is better and thinking about how to demonstrate to our funders and stakeholders and partners um, and in our research that there are different ways to kind of think about how we work together that focus on what's leveraged when we work together, levels of trust and value, um, the actual kinds of um, activity that happens when people come together and then link those to outcomes. All right, so that's kind of our network science background. So now I'll talk for just a few minutes on um, actually evaluating networks using this method called network analysis, which is a method in network science that you could use. It's what the partner tool allows you to do. So first of all, a couple of things. What are we actually measuring? So when we get together as networks, we want to know if it's affecting our outcomes. And that's, of course, the big question. So let's say here in this little picture you're seeing, there's partnerships for systems building. Let's say that's something we're doing. That's our network, right? We do things like convene stakeholders. Maybe we do needs assessment. We start talking about leveraging resources. And then we want to link that to an outcome. I just put an outcome here, child and family outcomes. So the challenge is, how are we getting from one end to the other? And most of the time, we're kind of stuck because we don't really know how to attribute the networking work that we're doing to those outcomes. Well, we really believe that there's an intermediary thing happening, and it's these systems outcomes, net, network outcomes. So things like perceptions of value, trust, authenticity of the process, um, goals, outcomes, and the actual process. We also look for measures of things like coordination, efficiency, like I was just talking about, maybe redundancy. We often set that in organizations in a community context. That's what this framework is showing. But what we try to kind of push people towards is saying, yeah, this is a good place for us to measure. We'd love to measure partnerships and as they relate to outcomes. But for this kind of work, we're actually going to take these intermediary process outcomes and put some measures on those so that we can learn how to get to better outcomes. We definitely believe that we need to get to outcomes like children and family outcomes, but that's a step that needs to come next. And then our goal, especially with the partner tool, is to then ask the big question, how do I use this information to manage the system? Or how do I use this information to translate back to practice? So I think a niche area for our center that we focus on on these kinds of evaluations is the translation to practice. And so we'll show you how we do this in a few different ways. So evaluating systems as networks can happen in a lot of different ways, but we do use it to evaluate things like how well the collaborative might be working, in terms of identifying partners, gauging their levels of involvement, leveraging resources, or strategizing how to improve the work. But we also need to demonstrate to the partner stakeholders, evaluators, and funders how it's progressing over time. So like this little picture here you'll see on our website, it's just an example of places in a network that you might start to focus on to do things like measure quality, um, think about who's connected to whom, and, and so forth. All right, so um, this is the framework that we use in our uh, network evaluations. And so what you're seeing here are just four buckets. Um, all of these will map onto the partner survey. So if you use the partner survey and the partner tool, you will have questions and data to answer each of these, to, to focus on each of these four buckets. The first one on interrelationships focuses on the structure of how network members are connected. So I'm going to be honest and say this is almost where every other network analysis stops. Um, interrelationships is not unique to us. Um, it's really the study of social network analysis and how you apply it to this kind of thing. It's where, and I'll show you some of this, you see the network maps, you might see a measure of key players, you'll see things like measures of density and centralization, all good stuff, all network analysis. But it's, well, in our experience, we have found it's very difficult to translate those kinds of measures to practice. And it's even more difficult for community members to understand what the heck we're talking about. And so we believe those are important measures and we always report them and we discuss them, but we need to go far deeper in our network evaluations using network data to look at other things like attribution. Attribution is something a lot of folks are interested in. We want to know why were these ties, how has this network developed and why, and what's going to keep it going. So we just ask questions in the partner tool, relational questions, 
um, between partners to ask how their relationship developed, can we attribute it to a certain intervention? Can we attribute it to a certain funding stream? And so we try to make sure that we have metrics on attribution of how the network is formed, and that can inform us in terms of what it's gonna take to keep that network going. We also focus very strongly on perceptions. Um, I always say that there's no real perception of a relationship except the perception that we have, um, there's no real measure of a relationship except the perception that we have of each other. So literally the perception that you all have of me right now and my perception of those around me is our real relationship. So we can measure things like the fact that we're all on a webinar together. We can measure that we maybe refer clients to each other. But we also want to make sure we're measuring perceptions of, we measure a scale of trust and value and use in a way so that we can use those data to inform how we might leverage those perceptions to construct the network. So when I kept saying we need data to manage these relationships, that's the kind of thing that is almost the most valuable. You'll find in the partner survey, those are kind of our trademark questions. The perception piece is something that we focus a lot on in our evaluation. And finally, agreement, um, we take all of our partner data. So we, my team does a lot of analysis outside of the tool that I'll show you today. One of those things is agreement. So we look at the degree to which network members, we kind of say are on the same page. So we'll report out the measures, but then we'll also report on the, uh, um, we call it a, a measure of dispersion. How much dispersion is there in agreement on what people are reporting? And when we have a lot of agreement, like how successful the network has been, whether they say the network's been not successful or successful, it's really helpful if we can start thinking about whether the people in our network are all agreeing about that answer. So we use this framework. We don't always dig into all of these different areas. We try to figure out what the evaluation questions are. And then we use the partner tool and the data in it to be able to answer this. And we can even expand that in a lot of ways. Um, so something we just want to note before moving on is that in network evaluations, context is so important. Um, so while we know that a lot of folks want to compare one network to another, and we, we get it, and sometimes we do it in different ways, most of the time we um, actually resist that. We, my team, and uh, meaning when we agree to um, evaluate a project, we believe that in each network there's a backstory that is important to understand. There's a culture and a set of ways of working together that might be different in um, you know, South Texas than it is in New York City. And we wanna make sure that we are taking into account all of the political and socioeconomic and cultural differences in these networks while we evaluate them. So we don't wanna give out scores that say, your network should look just like this. So we'll never do that in my center. Um, we'll never list you know, the five things that every network should do. Rather, we are very focused on helping communities identify where they want to be. What are their network goals? What are their goals uh, that they want to accomplish by working together? So we have this methodology we call the Partner Quality Improvement Methodology. And we will do this with communities. We'll actually use these thumb tacks and foam boards and rubber bands. And if you've been to one of our trainings, you've probably done one of these. But we'll really get people to really get their hands around this kind of thinking and put the thumbtacks in as nodes in the network, label them, put the rubber bands around, and really try to start to think of themselves as like nodes and lines like, and, and think about if they were to construct themselves, what would it actually really look like for them, you know? And what often ends up happening is these groups will take a couple of thumbtacks and those will be the center of the network and they'll put tons of rubber bands to them and sometimes those thumbtacks pop out of the board. Um, and it's, it's kind of dangerous, we know that, but it's very symbolic of how we tend to create network structures. We tend to put, you know, focus on something like a backbone. We think that we can put all of our resources around that one organization um, to build the network and what happens is that organization gets stressed. And so we have to have strategies. Do we reinforce the ties? Do we create more members that can decentralize the network? Just, it's a really great exercise. So what we use it for though, my team, is we'll have people finish it and then we come back to our lab and we will code the data. Um, then we'll, that's when we'll send an actual network survey out. So what we have is we get a, a, a measure of where the network is at that moment um, through the network survey, the partner survey. And then we also have some measures of where they have told us they want to be. And it's not an exact science, but we, we use this. 
So we're then able to identify a gap between the actual and ideal network, where people want to be, where they are, and where they want to be. So that allows us to create action steps to get closer to the ideal network. So this is a strategy that we really take um, to heart, where we're really trying to figure out how do we use the data to inform those action steps. You can read more about it. There's a paper that we have out there. So I've been um, talking about network analysis, but I want to stop for a second um, because I think it'll be a little bit helpful to kind of understand a little bit about folks out there. So we're going to do a quick poll while I start talking about network analysis. So if you're out there and you're willing to kind of uh, participate, um, go ahead and answer this first question. We want to know a little bit more about you. So what is your current role in the network? So let us know if you are a network manager, if you are a member of the network, if you are an evaluator, a funder, maybe you're not even involved in the network, but this just sounded like a cool webinar um, or something totally um, different. So go ahead and fill that out. While you're doing that, I'm going to keep talking. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce network analysis and give you a couple moments <laughs> to finish that out. But network analysis is a, is a method that collects data on who's connected to whom, how those connections vary and change, and focusing on patterns of relations. So everything I've talked to to this point is talking about using network analysis as a way to um, um, evaluate networks. And so in a picture like this, you'll see at the bottom, the nodes are the people, and the lines are the relationships between them. Those people can be organizations. The lines can represent anything, friendship, um, it can represent who works together, anything like that. Um, all right, so let's see for a moment here our results. So not too surprising, we have mostly network evaluators. We didn't give you a chance to pick all. We probably should have done that. Um, but uh, so it looks like we have some managers and members. And always fun, we have 11 people not involved in the network. So we hope this doesn't scare you off. Um, but you'll be more interested in networks after. So th thanks for doing that. It tells us a little bit more about who's on the call. We'll do a couple more of those in a second. Um, okay, and so um, a couple of ways to think about networks. Um, we're talking about in the partner tool using whole network analysis, or some people call it sociocentric. Networks vary in size, shape, and composition. You'll see some here. These were our first like 12 networks in the partner data set. We can look at things when we're in, interested in networks. We can look at the whole set as a network. We can pull out subgroups of that network. We can look at what we call dyads and triads and pull out just pairs and try to understand things like why are any two organizations connected? What's the relationship between them and why did they choose to connect? So we can look at it at almost any level when you have these data. And of course, there's the egocentric, which is just looking at the individual and the relationships they have to others. Our app that we've talked about early on um, actually is an egocentric data collection tool. We can do things I mentioned, like look at density. So I'm just putting out a few network measures here, because if I don't, I won't sound like I know network analysis. So um, the picture on the left is a high dense network. On the left, on the right, is a low dense network. Of course, what that means is the number of connections that you have compared to all those that you could have is your density score. So you'll see even the network on the left has a lot of nodes without a lot of connections. So that won't even be, you know, a crazy high density score. Um, but it tells us something about how many people in the network are connected. Centralization is something that's interesting to us, especially in community networks. The network on the left here you'll see has a more de uh, centralized structure where you'll see you can kind of identify the nodes that are in the middle, meaning those are the nodes that have the most connections to others. The network on the right is different, it's decentralized. We can't really tell who's at the center. And so um, one thing that we've learned by evaluating hundreds of networks over years here in our center is that networks almost always start looking out like they are on the left, maybe around an organization that's organizing. It's always important to have that first starter kind of um, role for an organization. But what you'll see on the right is a decentralized network, that's usually how networks evolve over time. They become more decentralized. We've seen the most sustainable networks are those that are decentralized, where we are not putting all of the accountability on one organization, but starting to share accountability, share facilitation, and share, even become more power balanced. So a decentralized structure is something we've seen over time as a kind of a goal, something that you might want to think about going to if it meets your goals. This is actually work for my dissertation um, almost 20 years ago now. So, <laughs> um, 
one last thing here uh, before we move on is a really popular way of looking at networks is key player analysis. So this is the Kite Network. What you'll see here is some positions that people play in networks that can be of interest to us. So here you'll see Diane has what we call high degree centrality, the most number of connections to others, while Heather has what we call high between the centrality, so she's a broker. Um, Fernando and Garth have what we call high closeness centrality, so if you kind of measure the if you actually if you if you count all the ties between them and everyone else in the network, they'll actually have the fewest number of connections, meaning that if we give them information, they give it to everyone else in the network, it'll most quickly diffuse. Um, that's the measure of degree, the count of the measures of the number of connections. In degree is the number of connections that we get from others, nominated by others. Out degree is the number that we indicate we have with others. And this measure is called centrality. Different from centralization, which is a whole network measure, centrality measures individuals. Okay, so here's my bridge slide. So the thing is, we, I, I talked a lot about, you know, here's a, a framework and here's some science and here's all these measures. And it sounds good. It probably sounds like I'm talking really academic from my professor position at the moment. But the truth is, the actual translation of the kinds of things I just said to practice, meaning how do we actually implement these kinds of things in communities, is a bridge that I think many of us are willing to cross. Um, thinking about evidence-based practice applies to our network, our relationship work, um, and we're all willing to do that work together. And how, however, that bridge is, this is my, my rickety um, missing planks over a treacherous river bridge picture because the actual connection between data and practice is like this bridge. It's very difficult to cross. It's very difficult to understand. And even in my center where this is what we live and breathe 24 seven, we still feel like our bridge is like this. So we have worked in partnership with communities for years on building our capacity and thinking about how to help um, communities build their capacity, and it's still not perfect. So this is a challenging topic. This is a challenging set of kind of data, and it's really difficult sometimes to actually translate it over there. So not making an excuse, but definitely saying this is not going to be an easy kind of evaluation, but it could be very valuable, and as we work together on this and communities inform us on what kinds of data are helpful to them, we can start building the bridge. All right, so um, I'm going to do one other poll real quick on um, who the, uh, who's used partner before I start this. So uh, Melinda's going to put up this poll, and um, we just kind of want to know who out there on the call has already used it. So go ahead and fill this in if you have it in you again. Um, don't have to. And as you're doing that, I'm just going to kind of um, go through and start um, – talking about partners. So partner stands for the program to analyze, record, and track networks to enhance relationships. Of course, you can find it at partnertool.net. Um, what you're seeing on the right here are pictures of our Network Leadership Training Academy, where we have um, folks come um, every year. We just love this group. It's super fun. Um, so I'm going to talk today about how partner can be a tool that you can use. All right, so who uses partners? It was designed for practitioners, but now evaluators use it and researchers. Okay, so here's our poll results real quick. So we only have a small group that have actually used partner before or been a respondent. Um, it's good that most people are, are interested in using it. I'm glad you're here. All right, so that's helpful, actually. Um, okay, so we've had a partner been used in about over 2,000 communities. And each of these users represents all kinds of different groups. So you don't even have to be in public health. You don't have to be in any one sector. This is a tool that is just um, adaptable across sectors. So um, I have this little slide. I think it's interesting. We made this for a presentation recently, um, kind of how Partner got scaled up. And I, I people, I, I think it's interesting to understand where part, what Partner is all about, what you might be um, becoming a part of. So. Uh, this is a little history of partners. So in 2006, we got our first grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to build this partner tool. Um, right around then, we started doing what we call community-based outreach. So one of the reasons partner has been successful is that, you know, we're not um, a company that just decided to build a tool. We really are trying to respond to needs in communities. So part of that is keep, you know, going back to community over and over again and trying to figure out how we can improve the tool. 
So in 2007, we did our first release to 12 pilots. Um, in 2008, we released the tool publicly, which made it freely available to folks. Um, in 2009, I moved from the Rand Corporation to the University of Colorado, uh, where we had a senior design team build our online platform. So we used our resources well then. We actually got a second grant in 2010 from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation um, to expand and, and build up the tool because we were getting so many people using it. And that's when we started doing monthly demos and ongoing presentations and things like this, just to outreach to people. We got our last and final grant from the Robert Johnson Foundation. They told us we needed to build a sustainability plan then. Um, but that's all the funding we've ever gotten for this tool. And in 2013, we started um, charging a small $50 fee to use it. Um, and that's when we really started uh, focusing on putting out training and tools to help translate data to practice. In 2013, we launched the Network Leadership Training Academy as part of that. Um, and we've just done our very first user increase this year. So for four years, we didn't even do an increase. Um, and now we're leveraging the data to build a new platform. And what you'll see here on these little yellow dots are um, grants and, and projects that we got where we were asked to build certain features into the tool. And every time we built those features, we released it back out to the public um, for free to use um, those features. And so that's how we built this tool, um, literally kind of grassroots, uh, kind of group working on this. And so um, the interesting thing is what I should probably show next is the number of users that have increased using it every year. And so if you're interested, you'll be joining hundreds, thousands of people who have signed up to use this tool. So what does it actually do? Um, it maps connections among partners using this method. We visualize partnerships, track and how and why they're engaged. I've talked a lot about this. Um, this is something we've started doing. I wanted to make sure we got, had a chance to show you this so we didn't run out of time. But um, this is actually using two other programs, one called Guffy and one called ArcGIS. All of this is data that comes from the partner tool. And what we've done is we've figured out uh, how another useful way to use it might be. So mapping it geographically and showing the relationship. So on the right, where it says information sharing, that's what a network map will look like. On the left is how we started mapping it and building these, we call them their storyboards. Um, and so we just want to make sure that you understand, like you can use any kind of analysis tool. The partner tool is super useful in getting that data and having a framework and a set of measures that you don't have to determine on your own. So what makes it useful from other tools? Primarily that it has a validated survey, it links to an analysis tool, it's flexible that you can customize it, um, but it has enough formatting to be user-friendly. You don't have to clean data. That's a huge bonus of this. So it works like SurveyMonkey, where you would set up a survey, customize it, and send it out to people. Um, I'll go ahead and kind of skip this. We are working on building Almost Partner 2.0, where we're going to have like a way that people can enter data um, for surveys in the future. I'm going to kind of skip it since we don't have as much time. So how does Partner actually work? Um, so members of a coalition or a network, whatever you call it, answer surveys. One person collects surveys and uses it to analyze. So there's these four steps. So once you um, log in on the partner site, you'll follow these four steps. Step one is entering respondent information. You have to, um, and step two is modifying the survey, then emailing respondents, and then analyzing the survey. So I'm going to go through these real quick. Entering respondent information is the hardest step in the whole process. This is where you have to identify who you want to include in your survey and also who are members of your network. The reason I say it's so hard is because it's just really challenging to make those decisions. Some people have their list and they load it in, but most people need to go through a process. If you don't know who to include, you might do a small data collection kind of exercise where you ask some key informants who they would include. A problem a lot of folks run into is that they make their list really long. The longer the list is, the harder it is for people to answer your survey. So it's something that you may or may not um, want to do, uh, but most people are working on making the list smaller at some point. Uh, that's a big challenge. Step two is modifying the survey. There's 19 standard questions. After question 19, you can add as many as you want, open-ended or multiple choice questions. I'm going to kind of go through them. This is an Excel version of what the questions look like. The first nine are going to ask, ask questions to the respondent about themselves or what they contribute to the network. So they look pretty much like normal survey questions. 
you're not really meant to read this, I'm gonna go through this. The relational questions, the actual network questions start at question 10. So here is where you'll see the list of all the folks you just loaded. You can ask two relational questions. The default is frequency of interaction and type of relationship. You can change this to anything, and we have examples of what you can change it to on the website. Um, we don't even use frequency of interaction very much. You might ask here it's an attribution question. You might ask what do you do together as partners, all kinds of things. Then we have three questions that um, let partners rate each other on the perception of value. It's a scale of power and influence, resource contribution, and level of involvement. I can't really go, have I don't have time to go into why those are the three measures, but it's all based on a lot of research that helped us build these um, measures. We also look at trust between partners, but we ask partners to rate each other on reliability, reliability mission congruence, and communication. So we never use the word trust. Those are the ways that we measure it. After you modify your survey, you'll send emails to respondents. Then you can analyze this, the data by uploading it right out of the, um, out of the tool, um, out of the online system. So I'm gonna spend a second actually going to the website. And um, can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is our website partner tool. So I'm not gonna be able to actually demo the whole thing, but what you'll do is if you're looking, there's information, if you're looking for the partner tool, you'll go here, and this is where you'll actually log in. So once you register, if you haven't, you'll register here. Log in, and when you log in, you're gonna see this list. And I have a ton, this is just kind of my demo site, um, of networks. So you can manage lots at one time. So I'm just gonna randomly pick one. Here's my four steps. Um, one thing I would could look for is this form that I would use to actually enter my respondent information. So I click there and it's popping up. So here are, I'd actually fill out this form and there's lots of tips on doing that on the website. Once I have that form filled out, I'll go to step one. I save it as a text file. Here's all the information on how to do that. And then I will um, load it in. I go find it and load, load my list in. So it's pretty easy, conceptually not as easy. <laughs> um, and then you can always come here to look at your respondents and actually edit their information. Then you wanna go to modify the survey, which is where you can modify your consent language or survey instructions. You can use the default survey, but most likely you'll wanna customize the survey questions. And this is where you'll go in and you will actually start to modify the survey. So you can do that here. It's where you can add questions. Um, or delete um, respondent responses. You have to leave the first 19 questions in there. You can't delete them. You have to modify them. Um, and then once I've done all of that, there's a whole email system. I can send an introductory email. I have to send the invite email. It sends an automated link. I don't have any set up right now, but it'll show you over here how many invitations you have pending to send. When you click on, well, I don't have any there. You click on it, you'll get a option to actually modify the email. So for example here, if I wanna create an email message, it'll let me modify the subject and the message. Um, I can send that introductory email, the invitation email, and then the reminder emails looking for folks who haven't answered the survey. Um, and lastly, I'll analyze the survey, so I'll just click here, and I can then, it'll start to download the data. Once my data file pops up, I'm ready to actually use the tool. So what I'm gonna do is go back to the Partner Tool website. From here, I wanna just point out a couple of things. If I go to learn how to use Partner, you can see there's a technical manual, some web demos. This teaching simulation is a great tool that has data in it. It has eight roles that people can play. You can open the file, and what it allows you to do is actually walk through using um, Partner um, in a way that translates the data to practice, basically. Um, if I go to Partner Tool, also under Resources, there's going to be a whole bunch of different things, the technical manual, a brief you can send to people. Here's the data entry form. Here's copies of the survey questions so you can work on modifying them and so forth. So once I do all of that, um, what I actually wanna get is the analysis tool, which I would open, take the file I just downloaded here, and put it in there. 
So just for a moment here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open the simulation file. So this is what a partner file looks like. Um, this is really simplified. It actually is that simulation file that I just showed you has an exercise attached to it. You'll see when you open partner, it's actually an Excel file. What happens when I load the data in is it loads it all in here really clean. So no data cleaning. It's the best part. Here's your edge list. So if you are a network analyst and you want to take your um, data into another program, this is where you'll just grab it. And you can grab all of those and import them into Kumu or Gephi or UCI net, whatever it is you want to use. Um, and here is actually the data cleaned as dummy variables on the right. So what you can do here is you can create network maps. So you can come here and pick different groups that you have put into the tool, shown by different colors. You can show the names or not. So you'll be able to actually draw these maps right here in the partner tool. You can come here. This is where you'll start seeing question 11 and 12 pop up. You can show different ways of looking at the lines. What you'll see here is we've measured overall value and trust. And when I click on that, you'll see the nodes get bigger when their trust scores and value scores are higher. And we also asked the question and partner about what kinds of resources folks contribute. And you'll see that when someone reported they contribute a certain resource, it turns uh, stripes. All of this is, is explained in, in more detail. So you can do a lot of this network mapping right here in the tool. Um, you can also, when I go to introduction, you can analyze network scores. So he'll, here you'll get a whole set of scores um, on uh, individual organizations that you can, and whole network scores that you can use. I'm not really going in through what they are. Here's where you can just get responses to the kind of, you know, regular questions, bar charts, and things like that. Um, over here, you'll see if you made changes to the survey, they all show up here. So it's just all very nice. It works together really smoothly um, in that way. All right, so that's the partner tool. And the thing I just kind of wanted to end with was how we disseminate some of our findings. So uh, I talked a lot about working closely with communities. So first of all, that's key. I'm going to go through these a little bit quickly. So we can do things like use the tool. There's templates you can use online. We offer an automated report that we do charge for that you can ask all your data to get put into a Word document. Um, you can do individual member profiles, customize reports, facilitate working meetings. Um, I'm just going to run through some of our stuff. This is You can, of course, do lots of neat visualizations. Um, you can pull out different types of agencies um, in your network to focus on. So I'm just kind of showing um, what I think is the most important is the data behind all of the maps. I think the maps are interesting. They get conversations started, but here's where all the goods are. You can look at the types of relationships folks have or organizations have together um, and kind of see how those relationships are structured and where the gaps are and where you might want to even build some stuff up. Um, you can compare networks to one another. These are counties in our system of care for babies and young children with special health care needs. Um, here's an example of a report. It's a little, it looks a little funky. Um, what you'll see here, you'll notice these little quality improvement ideas. We insert these in all of our reports. It's a spot where we always get people to stop, look at the data, and think about how you might use the data in um, making decisions. So we'll report things like that. We sometimes report things like this. We'll give a data point, the survey results, uh, some quality improvement questions, and then our recommended action steps for that particular organization. At the end of an evaluation, we might give um, a network 40 recommended action steps and try to figure out the four that they um, can actually use and implement, for example. Um, so you'll see things like that. We do short highlight documents. So this is just a two-pager that basically um, is a summary of a huge, you know, 60-page report. But we try to make sure there's ways that people in the community can understand the data and try to use it. We did this for a project. We take um, some of the data and help the organizations write it up in a short set of paragraphs so that they can use it in their grant application. We know that a lot of funders today want to know if you're collaborating and what that collaboration looks like. Better than just listing partners and all the meetings they go to, we think it's important that you have some data on that. So sometimes in an evaluation, this is one of the end things we'll use as a short write-up they can use um, for sustainability. 
And of course, we just wanted to show you one of the newer ways that we were kind of doing this work. So I'm going to end there and um, maybe go to some of the questions now um, that might still be outstanding. So thank you, Danielle. We have a lot of great questions. Um, two that kind of are similar uh, are we're working to build a collaborative. How long into the process should you wait before implementing the partner tool? And someone else asked more specifically before the formal launch and then six to 12 months later or six to 12 months after launch? So those are great questions. So one of, we, one of the ways we think that is the best way to use the partner tool is really early. It's our favorite way actually, because if you can get a group that actually is not formalized, you're gonna get a lot more interesting data about them. Once a group becomes pretty formalized and people get to know each other, um, when you get the data, it, it starts to you know look like a lot of people know each other. So um, we recommend actually for new groups that if you, so the risk of using it early would be that one of the first things you're asking people to do when you bring them together is answer a survey. And we all know how risky that could be. So you um, want to keep that in mind that people may not like to answer surveys. But if, um, if, it, if you explain to them that this is going to inform the process, a lot of folks will be willing to do it. And in that case, um, we think doing it really early is great information for moving um, the process forward. Then, and in terms of intervals using the data or using the partner tool or any network study, one of the things to keep in mind is that systems change is very slow. And so in, we say, unless there is a reason to believe that this system has changed well enough that you're going to burden people to ask them questions, um, don't do the survey. So don't do it just at a six month interval. You're going to get a lot of the same data. But if an intervention has happened or a big event, or um, you know, a training or something, you have some reason to believe a conference happened that things have changed, that's a great time to do it. So that's what we would say, use it sparingly, you can use it too much and you're probably gonna get frustrated um, with having a lot of data that looks a lot alike at time one and two. Great, yeah. um, this one hopefully should be a quick one, but uh, someone wanted to clarify, is this tool accessible to all of us? Yeah, for sure. So when you go into the partner site, you just register and we do have a fee. So the the, you'll see there's a few different fees now, but we think it's still really affordable. Yeah, and it's available to um, anyone um, who wants to use it. Great, thank you. Um, and this one might be another quick one. Is the tool geared to work with networks of organizations or individuals or both? So it's, it's meant to use um, with networks of organizations or networks of anything. So it could be people, you could put people in there. You don't have to use organizations for this. If you actually just want to study an individual and their connections, that's actually the kind of thing our app does well, or another egocentric approach. So this is meant to ask a group of people or organizations about their relationships to one another. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have a question here that says, for large, oh, not, not that one, sorry. Mm -hmm. I just lost track of where it went. Um, oh, here we go. I think this is a really good question. Can you give an example of how to use all this data to call or better manage the network? Yeah, so we think that that the best answer to that question starts with what is the community trying to do or what is the network trying to do? So um, ways that we have found um, to be able to use it is, for example, trying to figure out for example, if some of the people that we consider our key players or um, our main organizers um, are, are in positions that um, are best leveraged. So we might be able to understand perceptions of who could take some of that work, how we might decentralize the network. Um, we might be able to use perceptions in, in that way. But um, what we often find that we're doing is looking at things like are resources embedded throughout a whole network or are they clustered in one area? And if they're clustered in one area, can we find strategies so that we can better um, disseminate resources throughout the whole network? Um, we use our trust and value scores a lot to think about um, individual members, but at the same time, we might also um, be looking for things like subgroups and um, so we might take a subgroup, like we did this in one network where we looked at the backbone and governance organization and we pulled them out of the network and said, what happens when we take 
basically the leadership out what remains. And so that was really helpful to help us understand where we really had some gaps in the network in terms of sustainability and um, engagement and participation. So it's, I don't think there's any one method that you could use, but I do think that the partner survey is designed so that you come out of it with a set of measures that help you do this work. And so what we do after every study is we start to go through it um, the data and we work with the community members to kind of see what resonates like where is the information that is best informing their um, Desire and what their goals are so great. Thank you question um, And then this question you talked about a couple data visualization tools for SNA um, But this person was curious. What's your favorite one or what would you recommend for someone who's just getting started? So if you already have data and you're not trying to collect data, um, I think there's, you know, the one I learned on was using UCI Net, which had NetDraw in it, very easy to use. Um, we have a team member who's really skilled in Gephi, so we've started using that. Um, those two would be my preference, I think. Um, there's lots of other ones, but I mean, really you just basically you could put in the same data structure, probably an edge list, into any data visualization too, tool. But if you are just getting started, um, the challenge you probably will have is like, how do I actually construct that data file and get it in there? So make sure you kind of look up that stuff because that can really be the most frustrating. Um, but those are the two I would recommend. Great, thank you. Um, and then we have a couple of questions about who should you send the survey to? Um, for example, for large networks, what kind of criteria would you use to determine the individuals to whom this send your survey to, and then another one about um, how to determine, you know, how do you define connections, possible connections, in terms of sending it to whom to send it to? So those are actually two big questions. So the first one is um, how do you determine? So that's that bounding the network part. So we called that step one. And I said that, I, I mentioned that was the hardest part. So my guess is if you're asking this question, you are like 90, 5% of the people out there who are also wondering the same thing and I will I'm just going to be really honest It really is the hardest part and there's no way around it. So um, if you could like think about that in terms of um, Different criteria so some people will say who's essential to the work that we're doing um, But some people want to include those who are not already connected to the network so what you're in sense doing is bringing people into the survey that aren't already part of the network. Um, so I do not have an easy answer for you. It's a process that you have to go through. I think using key informants is a really good way to do it. If you use key informants and you can agree on a set, um, you might wanna come up with an idea of how many you don't wanna go over in a network survey. So there's a lot of factors and um, it's so hard that I could not solve it in this one answer. Um, in terms of the second question, which was how do you determine the, the criteria or the what you want to measure as in terms of relationships, again, that has to go back to what you want to know. So some people want to know things like who's referring clients to each other or who are doing actual work together. Others might want to say um, what are our activities, like do we share information, are we writing grants together, you know, what kind of like process work are we doing. Um, some it's a quality question or we sometimes even ask an outcome question. But on our website, on the survey um, under resources, there's a Word document for the survey. And at the bottom of the survey, we give a lot of examples of different questions you can use to, to, to do that work. Um, why don't I, since we only have, like we're kind of at the top of the hour, so what might be quicker is maybe I'll just go through yep. them. Go and if you need to get off the phone, go ahead. There's a ton of questions. So I'm just gonna spend like 10 more um, minutes kind of answering some. So no offense at all if you hang up right now. Um, all I'll say uh, for anyone wanting to hang up is please stay connected. Our team is extremely friendly. You're meeting Melinda here today. Um, everyone on our team is community-minded and really into building capacity. So, so just ask us, be uh, connected, and we're happy to keep um, offering these kinds of things. Um, and let us, one thing I didn't say I wanted to earlier is if you are interested in a particular topic for a webinar or something that we do, please let us know. What we want to do is be responsive to you all. And I'm going to really put myself out here now and say, if you even think you could do a webinar for us, please email us because we want to make sure our community is involved in actually the presentation back to each other. Um, so I wanted to offer those things. 
So I'm gonna go through some questions um, just down the list real quick. So um, one is what kind of functionality is there? So um, the partner tool was designed as a desktop tool. It was not designed as an app. Of course, it works on all the mobile devices, um, but unlike the app, which is actually the person-centered network app programmed for mobile devices. So if you can use it at all at, on all of those, um, it might not be as, as easy. Um, let's see. So if you wanted to write a grant proposal that involves the partner tool as a center of network science available as a grant partner, we, I, I hope I have not let you down to let you know we are always open to partnerships. So um, if you're interested in something like that, let us know. I mean, we have to sustain our, our own organization as well, and we do that primarily through grant writing. So um, we're happy to talk with folks about that. Um, in the resources there, is there a way to see what the survey looks like from the respondent perspective? Um, that's a great question. In the technical manual, you'll see pictures of that. So if you open the technical manual, you should be able to see that. You can always ask for a practice collaborative also if you're not ready to pay the fee for one and, and just work through one. Do it with your friends and family, you know, get them to answer questions. And um, yeah, you can, uh, we, we, we want you to try it before you commit, especially commit other people to it. So um, you can write to the partner tool and ask for a practice survey. That will probably answer some of the other questions on here as well. Um, so now we charge $125 to use the tool. Um, and then there's different um, prices for um, if you fall into different categories. So that was a question, what's the price? Um, so let's see, if partners or organizations come online later, is there a way to add them to the tool? So that's a great question. Um, it's kind of a survey data collection. It's a methodology question. So um, if you have, um, really you can't. Once you send the survey out, you absolutely don't want to add people to it because what will happen is if 10 people answered the survey and then you add someone, those 10 people did not have a chance to answer about that other person. So when you hit send and invite to survey, you really can't add others um, dynamically. Um, I will let you know that in what we're creating in our partner point 2.0 is a, a way to try to do that more dynamically. So hopefully it's gonna take a little while, but we'll have a way for that in the future. So let me answer a few more. Um, so is there technical assistance to help through the, the steps? We um, definitely offer help, technical assistance. People, uh, Sarah Sprong is our partner manager, and she is answering questions all the time. If someone starts to become um, like they need a lot of help, we usually try to ask uh, to engage in some kind of relationship where we're actually uh, they're paying for an hourly um, technical assistance fee. But if it's just questions about using the tool or quick things, we are more than happy to answer them. We just can't. We just have to cover our time. So if it starts to be a lot, that's what we do. Um, let's see. Um, does the tool include options for those who don't have access to computers? So we do, uh, often people will create a paper survey, especially if they're um, surveying people in other languages, which has happened many times. So there's a paper survey, and what we often advise people to do is send out the paper survey, set up the online version, and just go in and answer it yourself. And that way you'll have a nice, clean, data set that you don't have to start re-entering, um, you know, information into raw data, just answer the survey and you'll have the nice clean um, data set. Um, so let's see, um, have you used it on computers and buildings? Um, so we have not used it on campuses, building, cross college or interdisciplinary committees or groups. We did do um, a survey once in classrooms of our own MPA master's in public administration students just to look at how students interact. Very interesting, we found that our online students build much stronger networks than our in-person classes. Um, so we were able to use it that way. So whatever you're thinking there, I guarantee you could use it for. We just haven't done that ourselves. Um, if multiple networks involve the same partners, would you have to evaluate each network individually? So welcome to our world today. So we just launched a survey um, where we have multiple partners on multiple surveys. And um, what we do for situations like that is treat those people with a lot of care. And uh, we try to make sure that those folks know that we're sending out multiple surveys. We try to uh, communicate with them personally and ask them for a huge favor in answering more than one survey. And hopefully they will. 
um, participate. Um, so we do definitely um, run into that problem. There's some other solutions. We have created one survey that covers all the network and ask someone to answer a very long survey, which is actually not a bad idea, rather than asking them to answer several surveys. So you can, that's a good question to, you know, even at, email us and get some more tips on. Um, let's see, I'll do a few more. There's still some of you on, so I'll keep going. Um, uh, so, um, so in terms of answering the survey, it says, what does this look like from the perspective of those completing the survey? Do they all answer all 18 questions about each person? So the relational questions, there's eight of them. So they'll only answer eight questions about each person. The other 10 questions are, are regular kind of survey questions. You have the option to include more relational questions than just those eight. And if you do that, then they'll answer a few more. So the, the risk, of course, is that the more relational questions that you add, then the more uh, burdensome it is on the respondent. Um, so again, do a, do a test, a pilot, and um, you can see, I guess in this demo, I did not show you what it looked like from the um, person's perspective. Um, uh, so let's see. Um, so this, this is a good question. Does the tool work with open networks or only those that are well-defined? So this version of the partner tool, we use what we call a bounded network. So the bounded network is exactly that. It's the list of network members. So you have to load up that list, which means it is not loosely open. There is a different version of network data collection called a name generator, where at question 10, you would actually list the names of your partners. You can imagine how messy that is when you have to clean it. <laughs> so it's not automated in that way. We actually do have a functionality in the partner tool to do it, but we don't open it to the public. It's so burdensome that no matter who uses it, they need our help. <laughs> so we ask people to work with us in a more um, like a technical assistance capacity and um, have experience doing that. It's, it's not methodologically recommended on our part. You see networks tend to be kind of either sparse, people don't list as many partners, or um, or they'll, um, you know, you won't get as many connections as, as you, you, you could using the bounded list. The bounded list is far more methodologically rigorous, so we do um, recommend that. Um, let's see. So um, the published papers, someone asked for published papers. If you go onto the partner website, there's a, a link that says Knowledge Repository. So just click on there and there's a whole list of published papers. Uh, I see a couple questions on missing data. And so missing data is difficult. Um, so what we, when we are working with communities, we'll often say, so, you know, you have an, the average response rate in the partner tool is about 65%. So it's better than most social science kinds of surveys, but you do have missing data often. And what we do is we often tell communities, now you, you do have more information than you had when you started. So that's a benefit and um, a, a good thing. But um, what will happen a lot of times is that people won't, um, we just can't get folks to answer. So we can look at the data, it's called non-directional, which means we don't really care as much of who said what, but that they said it and we kind of count it as a relationship. So we evaluate all the networks with the data we have. We report on missing data, but we don't, um, we don't actually prohibit ourselves from evaluating because of that missing data. If we're doing research um, and we're trying to prove an outcome, we might have more concern for the missing data. One of the things we found though also is that when we, um, when we show people their information, their data, they often want to answer. So we have a lot of surveys that have 100% because we involve people in the interpretation process and for that reason they kind of want to come in and answer. So I would go, if you use the tool, just do your analysis with the data you have, report the missing data, and make sure that you're interpreting it thinking about that. So for example, if there's a really important partner that didn't answer, you might need to tell that as part of the story of what you're saying. Um, it says something about our networks, right, when we can't get the people to respond to the survey. So lots, it's an, almost part of the evaluation um, itself. Um, so for data protection and security, we uh, at the university have gone through our own IRB approvals. Um, we make sure to always promise people whatever the study calls for. So if it's anonymity, it's that. 
um, confidentiality usually. Sometimes we do show all the names. Um, our own database is, is, is secured, um, but I think that you're talking here about um, actual protection of people's data in a study. So you kind of have to make the call of how you want to share that and show it to one another. The most useful way to use the data is to show people the names of each other. So it can be kind of hard. Um, that's, that's one of those other very difficult questions to answer, but we present most of the data at the aggregate level when we're presenting it. And then we work with network managers at the identified level so that they can kind of do that kind of network management work. Um, so another, so there, yeah, there's paper surveys. Um, oh good, I mean, having answered a lot. Um, uh, let's see, so, um, so this is a good question. How, what happens when you have two to three people per organization and you want each to answer the survey? So if uh, this is not really even about partners, just inter-organizational network surveys. If you have multiple people in an organization, um, you would still only want to list that organization once and um, pick who you want to answer that survey. So I'm, I'm pulling up actually the survey um, form, or the, sorry, the Excel form that you'll fill out. So each one of these rows in column A has to have a unique organization name. It cannot be repeated because the computer, the, pro, the, the, the software will just think it's the same node. And your respondents will see the same organization over and over again. And they would never know how to answer that. So you can fill in these other areas. Here's where you put the person in. What we would recommend is that you ask those people to work together to try to figure out, um, maybe, maybe encourage them to answer the survey together. Um, you might wanna just ask who the best person is to answer the survey or make that call. Sometimes on organizations, people will delineate by like programs. So you might say like Colorado, you know, uh, Public Health and Environment Department, CDPAG, and then divide it out by oral health, early childhood, and so forth. But we kind of don't, we absolutely do not recommend putting people's names in if you're doing an inter-organizational study, because that turns it into an interpersonal network and it makes it very hard for people to answer. And we've experimented this uh, with this on real projects, and people are very challenged when you put a person's name in their slot for organization. So it's a, that's a, another part of that thing that I said that it's really hard <laughs> um, to do. Um, someone asked if it's easy for a regular person to answer, and um, I think it actually is. But it's but you have the option to change all the language to make it as you know easy to answer as possible. Um, so okay, someone has issues uploading their respondent list, so we'd ask you to just email us and um, try to figure out. Um, what's going on um, with that. <laughs> um, let's see, we still have a few people, so I'll just finish these last few. Um, so we do do the in-person, we always do partner trainings at the NLPA, and we did a um, two-day in-person workshop this um, last October, and it was really successful, we thought, and we loved doing it, our team had a lot of fun. So we're gonna try to offer those again, um, and uh, so stay tuned on that. Um, <laughs> this is so someone asked they've done their survey and they get over a hundred percent percent completion rate. Don't worry about that because there's relational questions. We just never we've we've never gone through all the trouble to basically put in the algorithm that says if they answer everything for everyone, stop at a hundred percent. We just let it go over because they are relational questions and we'd have to kind of work something out. So don't be alarmed by that. That's a good thing. It means that folks are answering all of their um, questions. Um, so let's see. I think that we should probably end there. Um, there's, a, there's still some questions, um, but we're at 12:15, so let's stop. And if you have some of these extra questions left over, we can always um, try to answer them for you by email. Um, if we capture them, then we can. Okay, then we can, um, in our, Melinda will send a follow-up email and we can try to address some of them in that follow-up email also. So, unless they're anonymous, then, oh no, we could send it to everyone, I think too, so. 
Um, okay, so thanks everyone. Um, I can't believe there's still 37 people hanging on to the phones. <laughs> um, that's kind of amazing. We, we, we think you guys are all doing amazing work. And so if there's any way that we can continue to uh, support you, let us know. And uh, it's just been a pleasure to uh, spend this hour of our day with everyone. So um, keep in touch. Hopefully we'll see you at the NLPA and on our next webinar. Have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.